Businesses are getting traffic, they're just not converting into clients, why not? Because Google's looking for sites that fulfill a unique search experience for the user. So the most common mistake that people make in the modern internet age. It's common sense, isn't it, what you're saying? It's not common practice. And that way we draw our users' focus so that when they land on the page, 1.4 seconds, they're clicking through going to where we want. I'll have to be really careful. You said that last time. I, I probably shouldn't be saying this no, on a podcast. Shouldn't. Let's help our own here. Let's everyone, help, everyone, we're everyone helping you here tuning in, this is all for you. Yeah. We reduce the bounce rate, we increase the search engine ranking performance, and suddenly, quickly, we're funneling sales leads into a logical funnel that's going to convert. And friends, if you're listening to the podcast today, I want you to know that we should never, ever do a newsletter ever again, because newsletters do not get opened. People are fed up of them. The statistics tell us everything we need to know about a newsletter. Let's address an elephant in the room, all right? Businesses are getting traffic. They're getting, they're getting some leads that's coming in. They're just not converting into clients. Why not? Or customers. Well, that's a really interesting question. And, you know, one of the things that I always find when I'm auditing client sites is that websites have not been set up in a way that creates a funnel to take that traffic to become a sales leader and inquiry. One of the things that you look at when you look at a website, often websites make my eyes bleep. They're too complicated. You know, you ever been to one of those websites where there's so many colors, so many things happening. It's just yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Well, just you, you by, call that making your eyes bleed. That makes my eyes bleed. Yeah, and I, and I can't stand it. And do you know what happens when your eyes start to bleed? You do one thing. You leave the website, which in our industry of marketing, we call a bounce. And websites that have a high bounce rate typically have a low search engine ranking performance. So it's a self-perpetuating downward spiral for sites that make your eyes bleed. They just don't rank well in search. Why? Because Google's looking for sites that fulfill a unique search experience for the user. Wow. So so hang on a second. The bounce rate means search is worsened absolutely so the higher your bounce rate the less engaged your website is and people simply jump off your site and a bounce a bounce is like five seconds or a bounce is a user taking no interaction with your page so the most common mistake that people make in the modern internet age is they put their telephone number in the top right hand corner of their website and businesses go like well i want people to contact me but that's think, probably 90 percent isn't right it? think about it logically your customer is looking to find you what do they do they come onto the home page of your website they pick up the phone they dial the number because it's there and of course what happens then they speak to you and so they, they exit the page and that creates a bounce because they've taken no further interaction on your website. Or it puts them off. Absolutely. Because where are we looking for contact information? It sounds obvious and it really is. In the contacts. Contact information exists within the contact page. Which is either on a drop down menu or right at the bottom of the page. Usually you scroll down. Contact. Exactly. It's going to be in the burger menu. So the three little yeah. lines, that's your burger menu. That's where the contact information always is. Now, the only exception to that is if you're running a targeted paid advertising landing page, which has a key action point, And that action point is for someone to click through to call. And that's the only exception to the rule where we want to drive telephone calls. Landing page. Because they've gone there page. for a specific reason, a different reason. The only scenario where a telephone number should be shown on the page is a paid advertising landing page. So that's for things like the meta ecosystem. So that's Facebook ads, Instagram ads, WhatsApp, Messenger, that sort of social ecosystem, or from a Google ad. Because if we're driving that traffic through to a targeted landing page from, from adverts, then that page is the page that has to convert. So we've got to funnel our audience to that page. So that's the only exception where I would want to see a contact telephone number on my website. It's common sense, isn't it, what you're saying? It is, but... It's, it's not common practice. Remember, James, the most important thing is actually the location of content on the page. And I like to call this the F principle, which is, by the way, has nothing to do with Gordon Ramsay. This is no, <laughs> there's no, no sense Gordon Ramsay's a legend. No, he is a legend, but there's no ease on this, uh, okay. on this podcast. This is family friendly here yes. today. Now, the F principle relates to eye tracking studies, which we in the West, when we read, we, we read left to right. And we form a capital F with our eyes within 1.4 seconds of landing on a website. So within 1.4 seconds, 
Your website users have determined whether they're going to stick and stay on your page or whether they're going to bounce. So if your content is positioned in the wrong place, so bear in mind they're drawing that capital F with their eye, they're first of all looking in the top left-hand corner. Yeah. So where does your brand go? Of course, it goes in the top left-hand corner. Don't put it on the right-hand side in the middle at the bottom. Top left-hand corner. That's where people look first. Where does your call-to-action message go? Well, it goes straight down. Follow that F. Go down from the top left-hand corner. That's where the call-to-action is. Bottom left. Yeah, my bottom left-hand corner of, of the page as you land. So same applies to mobile. What we don't want to do is position that contact button or the next step for our website on the right hand side we're going to get a lower conversion rate so the f principle is fundamentally important to ensure that we get conversions coming when we're targeting people coming through to our website it, right what you're saying is the, the first part of what you're saying was common sense the second part was definitely technical why don't people know this why why when i go on 90 percent of websites is the phone number up there in the top right hand corner. Well, do you know what it is? I think four or five years ago, everyone who was building website was building website for the this new idea of responsive design, right? The idea that websites are going to scale to a myriad of devices. And five years ago, we weren't really thinking about anything else other than desktop, tablet, and mobile. These days, the table that we're, we're sat here on could be a connected device. The, the chair we're on could be connected. Yeah. You go to your fridge freezer and those funky fridge freezers have got like that ipad on the front yeah. we well, can browse the internet these days on almost any device and so websites have to scale to the to the device that they're actually being presented on and so i think in the old way of designing a website we were so focused on getting that which isn't that long ago no, is it? it's it's moving at such a rapid pace and then we talked about this last time on the last podcast we talked about ai and with ai now driving search behavior we're seeing that this we're now living in one of the fastest paces of change in the di digital ecosystem so we really got to keep abreast of some of these things you know simple things like when you have a link on your website you need to make sure that that link is in web blue you say well, what's web blue you know google has conditioned you to click on things that are blue and underlined and i don't just mean any blue i mean that blue color that you know is google blue you know when you go to yeah. google you do a search and you see that the keyword it's underlined that's google blue and if you have a, a link on your website, a bit of anchor text that's got an underline on it, you could get up to 34% increase in click-through rate just by making that blue and underlined. So why is it that webmasters still insist on underlining the links on their site and your brand color? You know, websites that make your eyes bleed need to go back to the three color basic rule. So we have our neutral color background, we have our brand color, and then we have the call to action color which is your contrasting color, right? It's the thing that draws the eye. Most common cases, things that draw the eye, your primary colors, yeah? So red, green, blue. So red draws the eye to a place. So you wanna make sure that there's nothing sat around that button or that link. If it's a link, it's always blue. If it's a button, it's always red, for example. And that way we draw our user's focus within that F structure so that when they land on the page, 1.4 seconds, they're clicking through again to where we want. We reduce the bounce rate, we increase the search engine ranking performance, and suddenly, quickly, we're funneling sales leads into a logical funnel that's going to convert. And that's how we get the proven cost per acquisition and cost per lead model. True to form, Steve, you've started with ridiculously <laughs> level intensity, ridiculously <laughs> level passion. Though, you know what? That is all usable content for me. Of course it is. It is. And that, why are we passionate about it, James? This is the best subject in the world. Marketing. It's actually the number one of course it is. in the business. You know, a few years ago, we said this, I think, in the last podcast, but finance used to be the main yeah. area of focus. We're living now in an age where we have to be getting quantifiable return on investment from our marketing spent. And the thing I love about digital is it gives us total transparency over the conversions that we get from these different marketing yeah. channels. MQL, SQL. It's definitely some people won't even know what that means all right so just just define what 
an MQL is and what an SQL is. Absolutely. So MQL, marketing qualified lead, right? So a marketing qualified lead very simply has to have come from a location that we know of and it has to meet a set of deliverables, usually targeted and aligned around our persona targeting, right? So we're going for a business owner, a managing director of a company, turning over one to five million pounds. That's a great persona demographic. By the way... A lot of people have not even decided their personas yet. <laughs> yeah, and this is, this is like marketing strategy 101. Like, <laughs> let, let's go back to basic, understand who our audience is. Yeah. When we know that audience segment, actually we can target tone of voice, we can target messaging, we can target their behavior. So for example, I was running a campaign for a client the other day and they said to me, what's the best time to send an email? And I said, well, who's your persona? They said, well, managing directors of owner-run businesses. I said, well, probably the best time to send would be Sunday evening around nine o'clock at night. They said, Sunday evening at nine? Now, that seems like a terrible time to send. I said, well, it's the time that that user community checks their devices. How do you know all this? We know it through data. So as a data insights company, it's one of our real fundamental things. We've got to go analyze that data and look at when we're getting the best click-through rates. So if you just think about this logically, most of the people listening to the podcast, you're either in marketing sales or a business owner here today, right? So if you're listening to this, what do you do after you've had an amazing weekend with the family? You might have had a great relaxed time, whatever you've done, a few beers, whatever it is. You come there Sunday night and you're getting into bed. Maybe you've scrolled through the TikTok or the YouTube channels or whatever, the first thing you do is you go to your diary to check what's coming up Monday morning. Where have you got to be Monday morning? The next thing you do is you do a quick glance at the email and you see, oh, there's something really interesting there. What do you do? We click on it and open it. 75% of emails are checked first on a smartphone before they're even accessed on a desktop. So we need to make sure that our 75%. marketing... 75%. Yeah, we need to make sure our marketing automation is targeted for mobile. Some people do then unread it so they read it again the next day absolutely. so you're probably getting a double whammy effect there aren't you absolutely the, 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 getting it twice sunday evening interesting for that owner type person yeah md all right so sorry, sorry we didn't talk about sql right no we, we uh, <laughs> sorry answer we, the questions we, we, Steve. We, we, <laughs> in the heat of passion <laughs> so the mql it's a predefined uh customer segment right that yeah. we're going for we qualify it based on those deliverables deliverables so is there an opportunity is there a requirement that this customer has and if there is that gets passed over to our sales team and that the point a lead is transferred from a marketing manager to a sales manager the marketing needs to stop or it needs to move into a nurture phase and i think i've shared stories in the yeah. past of where there's been so many issues where marketing has continued the same old message, yeah. but actually that lead is now owned by the sales team. So when a lead gets transitioned from being an MQL to an SQL, the sales qualified lead has to have additional factors attached to it that mean that it is a live opportunity. In other words, that lead has a quotable opportunity that is going into CRM that we can follow up. Now that opportunity could be in six months time, it yeah. could be tomorrow. It doesn't really matter about the length of time. All the that matters is that there is a quotable opportunity that runs off the back of that. That would indicate some leads are warmer than others. Absolutely. And we've got to know which leads are hot and which are not. And it also suggests that there should really be a handover process between marketing and sales. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there has to be handover. Which, you know, but, but not all businesses have that handover process, but right? Look, let's. Let's just be aware for a small business right now, if there's a small business owner, listen, we're pressing some hot buttons here. We're, we're poking the fire because a lot of people are listening to this thinking, I want that, I want that, I want that. Sure. And we've got to give people confidence to do it. So yes, start doing some of this stuff and take the strength from it. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up about it. Of course. And you know, if, you've, if you're an owner manager listening to the podcast today, you're probably fulfilling the role of marketing team and sales team, right? How are you going to hand it over to yeah. yourself? <laughs> Hand it over from your left hand That's right. to your right hand. Here we go. Quotable opportunity, is it? Yes, tick. But there's a different way of thinking, though, now, isn't there? This is the point. This is getting them into getting them into the CRM, really. And now yes. we, we're approaching this opportunity completely different to this. We are. And what we've got to remember is that when we transition from marketing to selling, at the point that that customer becomes an SQL, sales qualified lead, 
our whole marketing activity shifts to be more focused on nurturing. How do we nurture a prospect? Well, we need to focus on our learning center, our blog content. We need to focus on the way that we communicate to that customer via email. What's our frequency of engagement with that prospect? Is it via email? Is it via text? Is it via a call? You know, there are so many different touch points that we can add. So let me give you an example. When a prospect moves from being a marketing qualified lead in my business to being a sales qualified lead, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a call with that prospect where I'm going to qualify them. And immediately after qualifying them, I'm going to put together some strategy document, which yeah. I'm going to send via email. But at the same point, I'm going to trigger a whole series of nurture campaigns I'm going to send them a free book. So I've got some thud factor. Something lands on the desk. There it is. It's always come on the door thud and the thud factor. factor. No, not heard that before. Well, some, some sort of physical, tangible point, yeah. isn't it? That is another indication to remind them of you. Another thing that we do is we'll send out a hard bound physical proposal document. If we're quoting for something, I'm not just going to accept for my proposal to get lost in That's email. Thud factor as well. Thud factor again. And I, I love that. What One of the ways that you can do things through lumpy mail these days by using some traditional lumpy mail, direct mail techniques to actually elicit a response from a prospect that you otherwise wouldn't get through digital media. And this is the power when you have an omni-channel strategy that starts to work in collaboration together to generate sales leads. Yeah, well, I wrote a number of things down there. Blogs, nurture, the whole tone of your communication changes, doesn't it? Is there any risk if it doesn't change and you keep marketing like you have done. Well, I look, I've told, told countless stories, and if you come to any of our seminars, you'll hear me talk about them all the time, because there is a real problem that exists, and it's, it's not a small business problem, it's a corporate problem as well. It happens when the marketing team are just putting out standard just marketing boom, messages, boom, 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 boom. and it's what I call the bang and blast approach to marketing. Is it KPIs, numbers, numbers, yeah, it's, numbers? It is KPI driven, but the problem is that bang and blast just means I'm gonna send a message out to my audience, and typically it's via a newsletter. And friends, if you're listening to the podcast today, I want you to know that we should never ever do a newsletter ever again because newsletters do not get opened people are fed up of them the statistics tell us everything we need to know about a newsletter people are just not interested so at worst case they do nothing they just leave it in their email inbox if we shouldn't send an a newsletter what should we send so what we should be sending is a three paragraph plain text email so it appears like it comes from an individual that with the greatest respect to your brand as you're listening today probably most people don't know about your brand Okay, you may be one of those huge multinational corporates. In what case, that's great. We know about your brand. But the majority of us, we're not necessarily aware of who you are. And with email marketing, marketing automation, there are three factors that get communicated via that channel. The first one is trust. Okay, Trust comes from the sender alias. So who is sending the email? It shouldn't be your company name. It should be James Vincent. It should be Steve Beltham. It needs to come yep. from your name. The second thing is interest, and interest comes from the subject line. So how engaged is that subject line? Look, I don't want to see personalization, particularly in a subject line. I want it to be short, sweet, to the point, so that I, it appears genuine. I don't want to receive a, a, a marketing email that in any way showcases that this is going to be marketing information. Okay? Do you know what the top performing uh, email subject line for September was this year? Go on. So far? It was September newsletter. I wanted to just take a knife and... That was the top performing... Top performing yeah, subject line that... for this month. September newsletter. So that means it's a good thing, yeah? No, absolutely not. That's because it form. means every, every company out there is putting out nonsense that says September newsletter. There's many different things that we could be doing yeah. to generate interest. How do we quantify a top performing, though? Is it the volume of... The volume of emails being sent. Not in terms of performance of, is Click it throughs. working? Yeah. This is just looking at all of the data of everyone sending campaigns. What's the most commonly used right. subject line? So it's not necessarily top performing. It's the Correct. most common. Yeah, most common. So we talked about trust. Trust, interest. Interest. The third one is action. Action comes from the preview pane. And in a desktop, of course, if you're using, using Outlook or something like that, yeah. a preview pane is quite large. But bearing in mind that over 70% of emails are now opened on a smartphone first, our preview pane is two lines of text. Two lines, yeah. Now, just think about this. If you're sending out a newsletter, how many times have you received a newsletter? And what's the first two lines of that newsletter? 
if you can't read this email, click here to view it in your browser. Or something like that. Yeah. Right? The view in browser comment. Oh, we which have is this. Utterly useless <laughs> from a marketing perspective, right? So we need to th change that focus. It should say, hi, or if you're being really trendy and millennial, hey. Hey, James. Because these days on Brad email. Sugar says, good day. <laughs> good day. So these days we don't say, dear in an email it's too formal it is and actually if we use the word dear or we use the, the word click here or we no use the word ever, unsubscribe don't even we get a spam score and three points is all we have in terms of email deliverability these days dear click here unsubscribe you say well hang on a minute steve surely if we're sending an email out to our audience we've got to have an unsubscribe and surely if we want someone to click through to our website we're going to have to use the word click here no let me just explain that for you, because if you're sending an email, the most trusted link source these days is actually a full URL path, www.iconicdigital.co.uk, www.actioncoach.com, right? Because we trust it, we understand what that link is. These days, with phishing and everything else, people don't want to click on anchor text hyperlinks within email. Okay, so they're looking for a full www.string. Okay. And you'll natu they'll naturally click anyway if they want to. That's right. So the next thing is the unsubscribe process. So instead of saying click here to unsubscribe, which is two points, three points before we get junked, right? <laughs> if we say dear, that's one point. If we say happy Christmas at Christmas, that's one point as well, by the way. So oh my God. quick tip before you send out your Christmas marketing, forget the happy Christmas vibe, right? So that the other thing is the unsubscribe, you would say something like, if you no longer wish to receive emails from us, visit our website here. Why have I not said click here? Well, that's one point. I didn't even mention unsubscribe. So very, very quickly, we've got trust from the sender, interest from the subject line, action from the preview pane, and we've increased our deliver deliverability rate from about 80% to around 96% just by following some basic principles with marketing automation. Powerful stuff, eh? Really powerful. I mean, that, look at that last point, just alone, that last point. If you no longer want to receive emails from us, click here, uh, not click here. Visit uh, our website visit our, here. Visit the website, yeah. you know, and Off do you what go. you got to do. Off you go. And, when and then, you when then they're in danger of seeing something on the website that they might like. Absolutely. And once you've got that person to visit your website, this is one of the most powerful things that we do for our customers is that we embed cookies within the context of our email. So there's something called a pixel cookie. Not the cookie you eat, by the way, friends. Yeah. We're talking technology. I hope everyone knows that. Double chocolate days. chip. Double chocolate chip, mint chocolate, whatever you fancy. But when we're talking about those pixel cookies, yeah. small thing, you can't see it with the naked eye, but it's there in the coat. So when that email gets delivered to you, that pixel cookie is containing your personal data. So I know that it's Steve Pelthorpe, Iconic Digital, Chief Executive, location if you want, address, telephone number, all of that information embedded within that pixel cookie. So the moment you come to the website and you've clicked yeah. on the link, do you know 96% of people still click yes to the cookie message? I'll have to be really careful. You said that last time. I, I probably shouldn't be saying this no, on a shouldn't. podcast because everyone's going to stop clicking yes it's to my good cookies. Awareness for, it's good awareness but for us. So it's let's, good you know, awareness. <laughs> good. You know, let, let, let's help our own here. Let's everyone help, everyone, we're everyone here tuning today. in, this is all for you. Yeah. So you click yes to cookies because we've been educated yes. that when we go to a website, we have to click that button that says yes. Since you said it last time, I clicked no. You've clicked no. Because you. Sorry. I hope I'm not going to disrupt the whole digital marketing world by telling you the, the I'll, secrets I'll, here. I'll click yes when it's your side. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So 96% of people are still going to click yes. The moment you click yes, my tool that is sitting there behind the scenes is looking for the pixel cookie within your email. So you click yes, my tool pulls that personal data into the website because when clicking yes, you have accepted my privacy policy and you said it's my right to claim that information that is in my cookie that's on your device. So I've pulled your personal information into my website and I'm now tracking you based on your behavior, what you're looking, how long you're spending on pages, whether you're going through to different pages of my site. So if you've got if there's a predefined user journey or a predefined sales process that I've got on my site, I can check to see whether you're exhibiting buying like behavior. The moment you're exhibiting buying like behavior, boom, another campaign set to be in a trigger mode that nurture. will respond Automate. to nurture you.
So you, at that point, you see you're already Automate, a marketing... Automated nurture campaigns. Exactly. You're already a marketing qualified lead once you started clicking through from a campaign. And people are not doing this. Why are people not doing this? I think it's just a combination of awareness and it's a combination of execution. It's expertise though as well. I mean, look, you're at the forefront of marketing. Sure. How do you learn all this? Look, I, I think we've we've talked about this over over years. It's outsourced, it, isn't it? It's the power of outsourcing. It is the power of outsourcing. Skills. Yeah. Look, my team spend a day a week doing research and development. We've pioneered something which we call the big big fun Fridays and super fun Fridays, which is basically uh, our idea of having an ideas factory. So we liken this to the Facebook uh, sort of time where everyone's like going in to come up with creative ideas. They do that once in a blue moon. We do it every single Friday. So we, every member of the team has to come to the business to drive innovation, change and performance through within the area of speciality that they're work, working on. And remember, people who do social media are different from people who do SEO, different from people that do paid ads. These are different brains, different skill sets that are required to take the marketing to the next level. And we talk about the seven steps marketing chassis a lot, right? These are the seven different digital channels that feed targeted relevant traffic through to the yeah. website. Each one of those channels requires a different skill set. And so those individuals that are running those seven channels, they have to be at the top of their game. So we bring them together, we innovate, we drive research and development, we use the AI tools, we use the power of the, the digital, te digital technology that's coming out, the latest stuff, and then we affect change. And that's how we start generating the results. So really and truly, if you're trying to do this in-house, it's a big task to do all of those things. And that's why agencies like us exist. I've never done this before, but you've, you're putting something out to me. And I, I, I want to challenge you to help me represent all the listeners here. I want you. What's better for me, a sales qualified leader or a marketing qualified leader? Well, sales qualified leader, of course, right? All right. Because you've got an opportunity at that right. point. So how am I going to get 100 of those in the next 90 days? Oh, let me think about it. Okay. Well, can, uh, can, can you help me get 100 <clears throat> of those in 90 days? I can. I'm pretty confident we can do that. Okay. And here's why. Because we've got seven different digital marketing channels yeah. that are each going to perform at different paces. So let's just consider the first. So the first, in my view, would be search engine optimization. SEO. SEO. A lot of people say SEO is dead. Fundamentally, we know it's not. It's just changing at an ever increasingly fast pace because of AI and because of the way users search. So 76% of people will begin their search journey to find a business like yours by looking in Google. Right. So, so number one, I saw SEO out. Yeah. Number one, SEO. But more importantly than that, um, that, with SEO, we know that people are changing their behavior and how they use Google. Why? Because of Alexa, the Google Assistant, Siri, people using voice. So these days, yeah, it's, true. It, it's not just about keyword. It's now about the questions that people are asking to find your business. Is, it, the, is Google going long form like um, chat GPT? Google is not only going long form. Google is going conversational. Google wants you, like with ChatGBT, to be able to engage in the future and have a direct conversation. Is Google and ChatGBT going to be in competition with each other? Google and ChatGBT are already in competition with each other. The race for AI is running at an ever-increasingly fast pace. And if Google's not careful, they will begin to lose market share because these days you can now embed search tools within ChatGBT. So there are ways now that you can, you know, with ChatGBT, there was the cutoff date yeah. for when ChatGBT4's knowledge came in. Well, now you can actually tell ChatGBT to link in to some of the new trends Have that are coming out. Have you noticed the version 3.5? It says, when I was last updated in 2021, <laughs> uh, this is my information. <clears throat> yeah. To try and entice you to pay for the ch uh, yep. version 4, basically. Of course. And these days with OpenAI... Imagine that, imagine if everybody pays $20 a month yep. for that. Imagine the amount of money being created from that subscription. And imagine the level of investment that is going into technology. And I even I think I sent you a video the other day that I was watching on TikTok as I was doing some of my own research yeah. and development. These days, you can harness the power of, of ChatGPT and the open AI to do so many things, right? 
that will enable you to take your business to the next level. Yeah. So that it's an absolutely amazing tool. But one of the things I always teach business owners when it comes to automated AI-driven content, it's great that Google is becoming more question-based in its algorithm. Yeah. So that means that rather than someone searching for a keyword, for example, in my world, digital marketing, 14,000 searches a month, the relevancy of that phrase is hardly anything, low percentage. An actual fact, there's a high volume of people searching for that phrase, but it's what we would call in the industry an information phrase. Yeah. I don't want information phrases. I want transactional phrases. So what I have to do is I have to extend that short phrase to be a longer phrase that typically will have a much lower search volume. So for example, let's go with the digital marketing example. So who is the best digital marketing agency in location? Yeah. That might only have like 100 searches, but the transactional relevancy of that search phrase is far greater. Yeah. In other words, when someone clicks through to my website off the back of that search, they are much, much likely to become a sales lead, sales qualified lead, yeah. and take a next step. So we've got SEO, right? And yeah. I know from SEO that over a 90-day period, I'm talking like minimum of 10 leads from SEO, minimum. And re remember, if I start SEO, let's take this cup as an, an analogy. If you're listening. I'm, I'm just writing down. We're going through all seven, yeah? I'm just. Yeah, I'll give you them quick because I know we're running on, on no, time clock. But look, if you're listening on the podcast rather than watching, I've got a glass in my hand. Uh, for those of you watching, you can see it. But your website is like a container of domain authority. And domain authority gets passed to you from other places, from other websites that link to you. Yeah. So first and foremost, we've got to get our website ranking on the right phrases. And we do that through the process called on-page optimization. So that's where we do a keyword research piece to understand the phrases people search for. Yeah. We choose them, and then we write content that exists on our website. Okay. Once we've got that there, Google says, yeah, that's really good. It's got the right metadata, the right page titles, the right information that aligns with what Google already ranks in the top three positions. So you want to do this practically, guys. Just do the search phrase for the keyword you're targeting in Google and look at the top three results. You'll see similar page titles. That's the bit underlined in yeah. blue. You'll see similar meta descriptions, the bit of text that appears underneath, and similar sort of content that exists on the page. How many images are there? Have they got a video? Are they 1,000 words, 1,500 words? Take the information that Google is already giving authority yeah. for. And then taking our glass as an example, what we've got to do is increase the amount of link juice or domain authority in our website. Link juice. And we do that by getting it from other places. That's called backlinking. And backlinking, we don't have to get thousands. We're looking at quality Good, back Good quality links. Those typically come from press releases, PDF submissions, social indexing, directories, those type of places. Well, a whole variety yeah, of places. Then. Absolutely. And the best ones are not the paid ones. So you don't want to be spending 100 bucks with a, an Indian SEO company that's going to give you 100,000 clicks and whatever. Backlinks. Yeah. Backlinks all over <laughs> to, the places. No, to, no, no. To, to a page with no authority. Yeah. No, we want a piece of press release press content that's uploaded onto an editorial syndication platform, things like ReleaseWire, My News Desk, some of the free ones that are out there. You can tag the location, tag yeah, the editors. If you ever got a backlink to the B from BBC or from something like that, I mean, is that a lot of domain authority? Absolutely. News houses have the highest level of domain authority. These days, it's going to be very hard push to get any form of anchor text link from the BBC and Sky and some of the most common you news outlets. you got to be pretty good for that. You, well, it's that they just don't do it as a matter of policy. Right. So what you've got to do is you've got to go the second tier down of the right. news outlets that will still offer those. That gives you a very high yeah. value. And then, the, then there's got to be others, haven't there? Really, really advanced websites. And there is. But let me just say this. And we talked about ChatGBT and the production of content, right? A lot of businesses are going, oh, here's a quick way for me to write blog content. If you write content that goes onto your website using ChatGBT, Google can see that it's got AI language markers in it, yep. right? And that means that Google won't value that content as highly as if it were written by a human. So here's how you write content that really performs on your site. You choose the search phrase, the questions that people are, write, uh, are looking for. You ask ChatGBT with a prompt, say, impersonate my brand. Um, come up with uh, the top subject lines. Make them clickbait. Suggest 12 subject lines that would attract customers to do X, Y, and Z on my site. You come up with that subject line, and then you say, suggest the titles or the header one, header two tags that I should use in this content. Suggest an outline. 
and then start writing content around those areas. That way it's human driven, but you've used and harnessed the power of AI it's good. to it, generate the content. It's giving you direction, aren't it? It def definitely gets the blood flowing, gets you yep. in the zone of doing it. You're still going to write the content yourself in your own language. Right, so we've got SEO 76%. Um, get no, it no, on the SEO, SEO, 10 leads 10 over leads. 90 days. And by the way, friends, with SEO, it's a gradual process. So with your cup analogy again, link juice tops up every single month. And that means that you grow your audience over time. So one of my best performing clients, the Harley Street Ear, Nose and Throat Clinic here in London, um, started with us having no traffic coming from Google, right? They now have over 35,000 keyword searches on page one of search. So can you imagine the number of keywords? Now, 35,000 keywords on page one. You imagine amount, the amount of traffic that that's generating? It's huge. So they continue to grow month on month on month as more and more the main authority gets added to their, their cup with the link juice from backlinking. So this is the power of what could be achieved. So 10 leads in 90 days is super achievable, but it's going to grow. All right, what's number two? Okay, the next thing is uh, we want to look at paid advertising, right? Paid advertising, there are two spheres to look at. We're talking about, but first of all, Google. Yeah. Why Google first, not meta ads first? Well, Google, people who search exhibit commercial intent. And commercial intent means that there is a reason why they are searching to find you. If you're focusing on those transactional key phrases that someone's searching for, then the likelihood of you appearing online is absolutely huge, right? And the thing is, people trust Google. They trust the organic listings yeah. over the paid listings. So if you think about your own search behavior, usually you jump down from the tr top three spots to go to the organic listings. Yeah, you do. The top 10, right? So why should we therefore not do paid advertising on Google? Well, of course we should, because there's still 4% of the entire search world that click on those paid ads. But the second thing is, if someone sees your brand there, it's completely free advertising. They've seen you. They've seen you, yeah, and you haven't clicked. paid anything for that privilege. Genius. You only pay when someone clicks. And if the click is good. Absolutely, because we know that we can get a conversion rate of 3 to 13% from an F principle targeted landing page. Right? Back so go, go back to where we started about how to get conversions. A landing page that's aligned within that F principle will generate a minimum of 3 to 13% conversion. Beautiful. So that's just a numbers game. How, how many leads can I get in the next 90 days on so that? If I'm, I'm assuming working, it, it will gradually get better. Yeah, and it depends on your budget as well. But look, let's just go for a mid-budget, say 500 to to £1,000, pounds, something like that. A month. If we're working on that sort of level of budget. A month or yeah, yeah, a yeah. quarter. Yeah, yeah, Just look at the numbers, right? So if we said £500 pounds a month and we worked on a, uh, a let's go for a 10% click-through rate, okay? So that would mean... Five, so 500 people searching for a phrase and we're working on, say, a pound a click, okay? Very sort of standard industry average. We're generating 500 sessions, okay? And 3 to 13% conversion. Let's go with 10% for the easy maths, right? 50, okay? Well, we're not even talking about 50. I would say from paid advertising over three months that we should be looking at 20 leads, okay? And then I also reckon that we can do some other things on Google Ads as well because there's a Google Display Network. So we talked about the search network. I'm counting, by the way. Yeah, I'm sure you are. Google Display Network is Google's network of partner websites where you can put your banner adverts all over the place. Remember, smart marketers always put their telephone number on a banner. Why? Because if someone calls, you pay nothing for the ad. We're only paying when someone clicks. So here's the nuance, right? Get your telephone number off your website, put it in the contact page, but on a banner ad, put your telephone number. Put it on big, the Google big, ads. Big, bold and center, right? Okay, so I know that I reckon I can get another 10 over that 90-day period from a Google from a Google Display Network ad. Is that 30 or 20? 30 in total so 20 or from 20. the Google Search Network. Yeah, and then? 10 from the Google Display Network. Is that, that the same in the seven? Is that on the same thing as paid ads or is that a different thing? This is all under paid ads in Google. Right. Yeah, so there are three three elements for paid ads in Google. Plus 10. The first one is the search network, that's 20. Google Display Network, that's 10. And I reckon then the third one, which is remarketing, we can get a further five. So just explain remarketing, right? Remarketing is when someone goes to the website, you cookie them, so you add their yeah. details into, into your remarketing list. And, and wherever next. they go for the next 90 days, you're then going to display your banner ads to them to invite them to come back to your site. 
Hammond's all the time with me and buying shoes, handbags for my wife. All and right. hey, I get advertised to get more shoes, more handbags, you know? So 10 from SEO, 35 from paid ads. Yes, sir. The next so thing. That's 45. Right? What one? We've done search, we've done paid ads on Google. Let's talk about content. Yeah. So our learning center, our blog, right? I love what Marcus, Marcus Sheridan talks about. He talks about you ask, we answer. So it's the, going back to this ideology of the fact that people are searching to find your business. So work out what the questions are they're searching for and then answer their questions with our content. Yeah. Okay. Content or blog on your website. On your website. And here's the stats, guys. And this is hot off the press because we've been doing research over this over the last two months. We know that long form content ranks much higher than a 500 to 750 word blog. How long is long form? So long form content is around 1,500 words in length. I've heard 1,500 to 3,000. Absolutely. The longer, in many ways, the better because people will go for white papers over blogs any day of the week because there's inherent trust in a longer piece of content. Right. right. So minimum 1,500 words and the frequency that if you can do it would be three times a week. Business owners are going, what? So what? That's ridiculous. Three times a week at 1,500 words, I'm going to have to employ a full-time content writer. Yeah, Marcus says that as well. But the reality here, guys, is that Google prefers sites that are generating a high capacity of content. So if you're publishing that content onto your learning center, I know that I could get a minimum of 10 inquiries coming from your content over a 90-day period. All right, so that's 10. So three, yeah, call it three a month, three, four a month, something like that. So 10 Right, minimum. now we're on 55. Yeah. What's so next? then we've got what we've done. We've done SEO. We've done paid ads. Content. We've done content. Let's look at social media, right? Social media. So B two B. We're talking about the the most popular social media channels, right? LinkedIn, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, Google My Business, X, i.e. Twitter, right? Yeah. Who knows what happened with that? We don't know what's in Elon Musk's mind on on X and Twitter, but hey, we're still going to post it. on it for now. He's good doing it. I, yeah. I, I'm a fan. You're still a fan. Great. I know some people have kind of broadened their horizons. They're thinking, should we be just be doing Instagram threads? And that's kind of falling away, falling over, isn't it? So, But then we haven't really talked about um, power of video marketing. So TikTok, right? So people often ask me, should I be doing TikTok for my business? And my answer is, well, who's your persona? Who are you targeting? Because more often than not... Is that not, your question to, ev to everyone? <laughs> who are you targeting? Should I be doing this? Well, who are you targeting? Should I be doing this? Well, who are you targeting? Look, the community of people that's going to be on TikTok is typically a younger demographic. You probably, like me, James, we're in our 30s, right? Were you in your 40s, 40s now? Whew, I'm still in my 30s. Holding on. And you're still very life. handsome. Thank you, thank you. Either way, you and me probably are on the cusp of that millennial generation that are going to be using TikTok. Should I be using TikTok? So if you are looking to target persona? that persona group, then sure, you should be using TikTok. Yeah. But remember, it's all about your um, level of investment that you're prepared to put in video content. If you can only generate one piece of video content a month, should you be on TikTok? Absolutely not. You need to be generating content every day of the week. If you've got an in-house videographer, yeah, by all means. But remember, look, I work with a company called The the, the Pool Guy, um, and he's got a great slogan. It's, holler your boy for the pool work. And what he does is he, if you see him online, what he does is he goes in to these luxury homes where they've got swimming pools in the garden, and the gardens are green, and the, the, the pool is green as well, by the way. And he goes, and he cleans it out, he chemicals it, and he basically transforms the pool from being a green heap of moss to being a beautiful, stunning environment. And he finishes his TikTok video saying holly your boy for the pool work now i know from speaking to the the, the agency partners that have, have worked with him that his main source of revenue isn't increased in the number of swimming pools that he's cleaning it's merchandise so the guy is making shed loads of money with caps t-shirts outfits that say holly your boy for the pool work he's not making money cleaning more swimming pools so look, if you want to become an influencer and you want to expand your reach and become the next big thing and sell merch online, TikTok's probably for you. But is it applicable for every business? Probably not. It all depends on your capacity to produce video content and where your audience demographic is. You are. need to have a physical product to do that. Usually. Could you do it as a service? Could it, you? It's, you can. It's harder. It's easier when you've got a physical, tangible product that you can sell. I've seen people doing it on Instagram big influencers yes. with 10, 12 million followers type thing, yeah. then they're selling the subscriptions. And look, training 
works exceptionally well within that. A friend of mine is a, an influencer within a particular demographic, and he's got over a million followers now. And he puts a training course, which was a fairly expensive training course, $1,500 was the training course to get accessed with him on Zoom for a week. And it was a full program. You know, he sold that out to over 400 slots within... I think it was a couple of days just wow. by marketing. Wow. So the power of, um, you can imagine that the funds that are generated from that. So what should we do on social media then to generate leads over the next 90 days? So businesses in B2B, you're going to be focusing on LinkedIn. Three posts a week maximum, not from the company page, from your own personal page. Three posts a week max. Maximum. If you're going more than three posts a week, then you're actually going to disrupt the LinkedIn algorithm. You're not going to get engagement. So what, what does happens link- if you do a live on LinkedIn? Is live on LinkedIn is great. Yeah. Is that one of the posts? If you can do live, any form of live content is going to be better. Stories over posts, right? So three posts a week on X, uh, sorry, on uh, Instagram and Facebook, five to seven posts a week on X, daily, in other words. Yeah. Stories perform better than posts, and all of the algorithms, both on LinkedIn and Meta, keep story content alive for, for longer. The most important metric that you've got to consider on LinkedIn is the number of comments you get and the number of likes. So remember, when you hover over a post on LinkedIn, you know you get the little like button. If you hover over that like button, you also get the heart and the information and the love you symbol. All of those other symbols carry a greater algorithm authority because someone's actually had to go in and yeah. click on it. So encourage your community to comment on your post, to share it, to like it, to get involved in it. Remember, social media is person to person. It's not B to B. It's not B to C. It's individual to individual. It's the power of yeah. individual content. So I reckon if you are following just the simple five basic social channels, which is Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google My Business for the power of SEO and X, I reckon we can get a minimum of three sales qualified leads a month. That's nine over 90 oh, days. I thought you were going to say minimum. a lot more than that. So, all right. So that takes us to 55, 64. 64, are you going to, oh man, how am I get to get, going to get to 100? 10, 20, 30, oh, come on. We, We've got 35. two more channels, right? To Out of our, our, our ones that we've been talking about today. The first one is meta ads, and we haven't spoken about those. All right, so this is Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Yep, exactly that. So the meta ecosystem, two above the line social channels, yeah. and two what we call dark social channels. So we've got Instagram, Facebook, the, the they're, live social they're channels. They're above the line. They're above the line. Then we've got two dark social channels. Messenger, WhatsApp. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I get what Both you're within that meta universe. So there's four there, isn't there? There's four. And so, of course, within Facebook, we've got all the other apps as well. So Facebook Dating, Facebook Marketplace, all of those that come under that Facebook brand. Okay. So with meta ads, the difference between Google ads and meta ads is that on meta ads, we've got to be super disruptive. Why? Because when you go onto social media, you're there to browse pictures of your friends and family and to post stuff that's happened in your life. You're not going there to find something like you are in Google. Okay. So users on Google are already exhibiting commercial intent. They're already looking for you. On Facebook, we have to deploy a strategy. And here we go. This is it. Stop the scroll. That's your strategy on Facebook ads, meta ads. What do I mean? Your ad on meta has to be disruptive. It's got to stop people in its tracks. How does it do that? Well, firstly, it's got to have some faces on it. People sell people. People buy people. Yeah. If I see a face, I immediately stop scrolling because I'm going to be engaged with that individual. I also want to see motion, movement, colors that lock me in. So something that gets me fixated on whatever it is to just stop and look. Even if it's quick moving, something that happens, video content. We can't have stills on Meta as it just doesn't work. So we've got to use something that's going to stop the scroll. Got it. Okay? Simple. What we can then do is we can be really targeted in our persona targeting because we have the power on meta to go after the exact demographic that we're looking for. So we talked about business owners. If we're looking in a location, London, Manchester, Liverpool, wherever, we can go after a specific demographic. We could also go after owners of certain cars. So you said, well, we want to target high net worth individuals. Let's go Ferrari. Let's go Bentley. Let's go Porsche. 
let's go certain classified classified Mercedes vehicles. We can go after those really niche vehicles and go, well, that if that someone's interested in that, maybe they've got capacity. So we can really tweak things around. There's still certain things within the meta universe that will let us do um, matching of, uh, of audience data. So in other words, if I create an audience segment, we can say to meta, go and get me similar types of leads to these ones here. That's really powerful. So I reckon on Meta, I could generate you five leads a month. So that's 15, right? 15 over a 90 day period. Yeah. So that takes us to what? 64, 79. 79. So I've got to get you 21. Easy peasy. Marketing automation, our final one. We already spoke earlier in the session about trust, interest, and action. Trust from the You're sender. You're seven a month for this. Huh? You'll need seven a month for this. Seven, no problem at all. Marketing automation. Let me show you how we're going to do that. Is these the campaigns that are automated through nurture? These are both scheduled campaigns and triggered campaigns. The difference being a triggered campaign is your bag and blast one that goes out at a set time. Sunday ne evening for business owners. Newsletter type Tuesday. email. No, 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 no. please. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No the, newsletters. Yeah, the, yeah. the email type <laughs> thing. Exactly. We're talking email marketing, right? So we're going to send out an email communication, which is going to be a three paragraph plain text email. Paragraph number one. Why are you in touch? Paragraph two, what you're offering. What's the service? What's the product? Paragraph three, the call to action. Okay, simple stuff. Three paragraphs. That's it. Don't make it four. Don't make it five. Don't put I love you, kisses to your success, whatever else you it's put brevity. at the end. This is brevity. Keep it brief. And the call to action, by the way, could be to click through or it could be just simply to respond to the email. And remember, the call to action is not click here it is your website yes www in blue here it is absolutely blue increases open rate by how much click through rate by how much 34 percent. 34 percent. yes you want to increase that click through rate by 34 percent underline blue link okay remember people are more likely to trust your email if you list the full url path okay Amazing. so this is a numbers game trust interest action sender subject line preview pane when we then talk about uh, conversion rates, I will always advocate sending to an audience group of around about 10,000 people. And some people are going to shoot me down and go, why? Here's why. Because the average campaign, I know this by looking at the data over the last three months from my clients, is an average of 10%. 10% open rate and a what's the click through rate, it's only around 1%. So email is a diluted channel of communication these days because we get so much of it. So don't be afraid to repeat campaigns and send them over and over again. Quick tip, I will send a campaign within two days uh, to anyone who has not opened it, and I will change the sender alias, and I will change the subject line. The content of the email is exactly the same. The mind, it? I'm just changing it? the person I've sent it from, and I'm changing the subject line. Yeah. And that will increase your open rate. So we can do smart stuff like the, that. It's regularity as well, isn't it? Yeah. It's just. So let's just follow the maths for a moment, James. Right. 10,000 people, 10% 10 open rate is 1,000 yeah. people, 1% 100. click through rate is 100. What's the conversion rate from our landing page? No, 1% on 1,000 is 10. From no, from the audience that we're sending to. Oh, yeah, 1,000. Yeah? yeah, so we've got 100 people. 100, yeah. Yeah, what's the conversion rate from our landing page? 3 to 13%, remember? We yeah. talked about landing page conversion so right at the mi start. Middle of the road, 7. Yeah. So, okay, go from middle of the road. To, but for the, I can't do 7% in my head. I'm going to do 10%. Right. So help me, help me out. Help, help an old boy out. So we've got 100 people coming to our website. If my landing page can convert 10% of them through all the to F principle to a marketing qualified lead, that's 10 people per campaign. And two campaigns a month. Minimum of two campaigns a month. Because well, that, remember, that, that I'd only hit as 99, not 100. I, I didn't I just have <laughs> to hit 21 leads to make the 100? Oh, you did. Yeah, so there you go. There, we've done it, just there. So we've got an audience group of 10,000. Yeah, oh, the 10 each month. Even if, so we, are we talking 30 leads then, 10 a month? I reckon I could easily generate you um, from email marketing of a 10,000 uh, database. It's got to be fresh data, good quality data. And by the way, if you want to get that data, we're now, we're now partnered with some of the UK's leading data houses. So we can right. get that data for you on a perpetual license. Okay. Follow me on Instagram, Steve. So are you helpful. saying over a quarter, 30? I, I know I can generate you a minimum of 21. 
which is the number you need, right, to hit the 100. All right. But I reckon from every single campaign, if we're working on 100 clicks and we're working on a 3 to 13% conversion, that's 3 to 13 leads per campaign. Well, we, did, we didn't work on 3 to 13. We worked on a 10% for maths. I know. We did. But bottom level, 3, right? 3 to 13%. Even if it's 3, we're still going to hit 21 if we're doing a number of campaigns. It, if you've got a the number of period. campaigns. Yeah. You would need... To have a, somewhere between two and three campaigns a month. Yeah, no, we'll be. I think you need eight. Even you, look, even you, if you you're need hitting, seven campaigns over three months. Yeah, which is totally achievable. Then you get the hundred. Yeah, there you go. Congratulations. Hundred we- sales leads in ninety days off the cuff, using the seven steps marketing chassis. That's how you do it. And so, if you want that level of consistency, it's about how we deliver this on a continual basis through omni-channel campaigns. You see, I'm I'm definitely inspired by that i mean i love the fact that we've hit the hundred i love the (laughs) fact that we've got the depth and detail i feel like i just need a rest and need to digest (laughs) and probably go and listen to it again or yeah you know these uh, podcasts they're high energy high impact and that 100 you're giving us everything you've got you're giving us it it's amazing i've got some quick questions for you go for it and (laughs) i've got to be creative with this because you're the first person that brought back twice Actually, you're not. Brad Sugars has been back hey, twice. You're Brad. Yeah. Up with Brad. Yeah, you're up Love with it. Brad. Love Brad Sugars. Um, what annoys you the most? In general. What annoys me the most is mediocrity. Ooh, interesting. I, I want to see real things happen. So I like high-performing people that are actually going to make stuff happen. I don't want mediocre results. I want excellent results. Make it happen. Even Make says it on that, happen. On that hat. Right. All right. So mediocrity <laughs> is it most, annoys you the most. What's your favorite brand? Oh, that, this is a really hard one, right? Because I love brands that stand for things, that have cause behind them. So cause-related marketing. So one of my favorite brands is, uh, and it's partly selfish because I know the marketing manager who's, who's behind that brand, but Innocent Smoothies, right? Oh, yeah. So everyone knows Innocent They've got great message. It's the quality of the the product that goes in. They also do a shed load it's of a nice good. name as well. Isn't Innocent. It? Innocent, yeah, of course. But I really love brands that have meaning behind them. And just the other day, quick shout out to an action coach client actually. So uh, Mark at Bison uh, Media. He's a creative agency, and he work, he's working with a uh, an action coach um, just down down the way from from where we are. And uh, I went to their corporate day actually just last week, and they have done a fantastic job with a brand which is called the Big Cat Sanctuary. Okay, so lions, tigers, panthers, etc., all of that. They've done some beautiful imagery and stuff like that. So nice. from a creative perspective, go check them out. It's absolutely sensational. Nice. Good cause as well. Favorite TV show? TV? I don't have time for TV. No, I do have time for TV. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, I, I g- genuinely, I don't watch television in the way that I think most people watch television now. I like watching television on reels, so I, I watch TV via TikTok and via YouTube. Really? So yeah, because because you don't want to pay a, a, a no, license. No, no, not nothing to do with that. Because <laughs> you're a cheap skate, Steve. No, no, nothing like you're that. Definitely it's, not a cheap skate. I've seen your car. It, it's because I like consuming it in short segments. Right. So I don't want to watch hours and hours of television. I want to have a big hit, and I, I I'm a big foodie, so I love Gordon Ramsay. I even like Jamie Oliver. I know they compete. I like all of that sort of stuff that's uh you know um <laughs> brand smiths uh oh yeah, yeah, I've, 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 yeah. well you do their marketing yeah. actually that's right and uh they're god and ramsey's lawyer that's right i do <laughs> and we we work for jamie oliver which is kind of <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> to be careful don't we but i like, know i love i love stuff like that this recipe focus get into it and i, I often like saving reels as well so download them nice. on my phone and also it's one of the ways i keep up with what's going on in the whole realm of ai and digital yeah. is i'm consuming lots of content around my subject area as well so i listen to a lot of ted talks and things like that with yeah. influencers sharing what they're doing right you see, now see that's not a tv show ted talk that yes, is yes. that you 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 get in the knowledge. All right, what's your favorite car? Ah, oh, come on! I drive a Bentley Continental. I love the W12. So super fast, super expensive to run. I mean, the amount I spend on fuel. For all of you uh, uh, environmentalists, you're probably uh, not going to be as keen on me now. But 
it's a beautiful car. You do your bit for it. the environment, though, don't you? You give back and you, you profitable yeah, donations. Absolutely, yeah. Look, we have a really strong driver in our business. I believe every business owner has a responsibility to be a good corporate citizen, and one of the ways we do that is by um, giving thirty percent of our profits to good causes. And that really just is about doing good. It's about helping out. Yeah. It's about pioneering and forging ahead in our industry to give into things that really matter. So this year, I think we just uh, was presenting a check the other day to the Lord Mayor's Charity Appeal with the I've Sheriff of London. That, yeah. that was great fun. Went to the old Bailey there, gave him a big big old check, and that's going to support some great charities with MQ Mental Health and uh, um, some other great causes as well. But we've also given to things like Teenage Cancer Trust. So I think a business has to do good. We've got responsibility yeah. as business owners, haven't we? So how we how we do that and affect change, support the environment, sustainability, all those you things You get everywhere, really man. You get around everywhere. <laughs> all right, so th this one is... Um, this one is interesting what's your most powerful routine personal routine oh wow okay a few years ago i was listening to a guy who was encouraging i forget who it was it was a biz x event as well so i'll tell you probably is, uh, and he was talking about the power of discipline and actually he mentioned the word rituals so um you know if you are a buddhist you are really into rituals and then i'm i'm not i'm a christian and so the word ritual can come with a bit of a dirty sort of uh, meaning connotation yeah. to it but actually what the guy was saying was the power of rituals and setting up disciplines and behaviors can change the way in which you live and 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 start to start doing things so i realized that first thing in the morning i don't perform particularly well okay i'm a night owl if you want to set me to work at 2am that's absolutely fine try and get me up at five in the morning i'm not going to get much done okay and i know a lot of people really advocate getting up in the early in the morning do your gym activity or whatever but i have a really strong ritual and the ritual is that I wake up at 7.30 in the morning and the first half hour of my day, I dedicate to do certain things. So I will watch and consume content at that time in the morning. So at that point in time where I'm kind of coming around, I'm discovering that point in time is where wow. I focus those things. I make sure that I see my kids off to school every day. Okay. I also make sure that at 5.30 I'm home because I want to be there for, for bedtime routine. So there's certain things that I don't compromise in my schedule. And that's one of the ways that it's really enabled me to have a, a really solid flow. The other thing I do is I make sure that those around me um, communicate with me in a certain way. And we've never talked about this, actually. It's quite interesting. So three things. Um, the first thing is, Steve, decision. I want to be making decisions in business. I don't want to be answering questions. Yeah. I want to make decisions. And I'm most powerful when I'm making decisions as well because I can be detailed and affect change. So if you've got a question for me, it's probably going to be answered by another question. So you ask me a question, I'm going to say, well, what do you think about it? So if a member of my team comes to me with a question, I'm going to say, bring it to the weekly meeting or what have you thought about it? Right? So question comes with a question. And the third thing is, Steve, FYI. This is just for your information. You need to know it now. And normally an FYI statement is going to be followed by, well, can you bring it to the weekly meeting? Because unless I need to know that right now, that's not something that I need to know at that point. So, so you're you constantly things. managing the, the amount of information. Yeah. People always ask decisions. me, that I'm a full time um full-time in the business as the chief executive at Iconic Digital, which is obviously is a digital agency, which is my passion. But I'm also a full-time pastor, which is a voluntary thing. So I'm dealing with people in the church all the time. Yeah. And that's super busy. People, people issues every day of the week. I'm also traveling, helping to um, oversee different projects. You do speak on marketing places. on global yeah, platforms. Well. Of course, yeah, all, all the time. And so I'm traveling about eight to 10 weeks a year normally um, doing that. So I'm here, there, and everywhere doing these things. I run property business here in the UK, property business in the States. So lots of different things going on. People always ask me, how do you keep in the flow? And it's about setting rituals and processes in my life that keep me mentally sound, my mental well-being good, but enable me to make quality decisions. So keeping on top of my health, keeping on top of what I'm eating, what I'm, the exercise routines that I'm doing. For those of you who don't know me, I've lost 85 kilos over the last two years. So it's been a real change that I've had to make because I was a Remarkable. big, big guy. I had to really make some changes there. And I knew that if I kept going, I'd, to be honest, I'd be an, ending up in a box. So one of the things that I said is I've got to make a change there. So I started that journey. And then I went through a process of saying, well, I've got all this excess skin, right? <laughs> what do I do with it? So I then went through the, the transformation to have it all removed. But now I'm in that phase of going, well, now I have to maintain and so maintaining is all about intake. It's all about consumption. You know, if you're like me and you're a business owner, you're entertaining clients, doing all those things. 
you know, drink and eating is all part of that. So you've got to be careful. You've got to make sure you get those routines, disciplines in place. So the way that I do that is by putting rituals in place in my life. Really good. Really good. A lot of people are going to repeat that. You know, <laughs> go back and listen to that five minutes. A lot of inspiration for everyone. Speaking of inspiration, who's the most inspirational speaker you've ever seen? Oh, wow. I know I've, I've listened to so many inspirational speakers over the years. You know, my favorite go-to speakers when it comes to marketing, of course, is Seth Godin. Yeah. I love Seth and uh, he's always hammering some key principles home for me. So I, I love, I've, I've spoken on platforms with him before and love listening to his content. Of course, I love the the, the Brad, Mr. Brad Sugars himself. Mm. And I, I get inspired every year when I come to BizX. It's one of the reasons why we sponsored it last year and why we want to keep coming back and bring our team just because we get so yeah. much good stuff and so, um, yeah, I, I'll go with OC for now. All right, Seth and Brad, there you go. They've both spoke at BizX on the same platform as well. Yeah, there you go. All right, what's the first thing that people should do when they listen to this, once they've listened to it? Okay, so as you're listening to this podcast today, I think the first thing to do is to take some actionable next steps, right? Go back through, listen to it again. We've talked about the seven steps marketing chassis. We talked about conversions of your website, how to turn your website. By the way, if they've not listened a... to the first one, they should have listened to that first one. Oh, for sure. This is a compliment in that. It is, yeah. And we talked through quite a number of different things in the first one of how to get things working. But conversions is the most important thing for yeah. your website. And if your website's not converting, think about how you can redo it. Look. I'll give you a free marketing audit, £2,500 of free consultancy. Head over to our website and we'll do that for you free of charge just to get it working for you. Um, Iconicdigital.co.uk, shameless plug. But jump on there and we can get you set up for that. Once you've done that, listen to the podcast again. I think, you know, we've done it off the cuff for how to get, what was 100 sales leads in 90 well, days? Well, we've got somewhere between 100 and 109 in there. <laughs> okay. So we've talked through the channels. So we've talked about SEO, mm. paid ads. We talked about the Google Display Network. Remarketing. That's a marketing plan, isn't it? That is, yeah. Content, social media, meta ads, email marketing, marketing automation. Meta ads. I mean, look, you've got Facebook, you've got Insta, but you've also got Messenger, the dark ones that you mm -hmm. mentioned. Yeah. Every day is a learning day. Dark social. That, you got Messenger and WhatsApp. Yeah. Oh, it's mad. There's so much you can do with WhatsApp. Yeah. I, I bet we can get even more leads than that. All right. Just right. remember the marketing funnel though, James, right? As we're checking out the last sort of thought, your marketing funnel is about driving targeted relevant traffic through to your digital asset. At the top of that funnel is brand awareness. Coming down is market engagement. And then at the bottom of the funnel is lead generation. And if you're a business owner and you're looking at this today listening, you're saying, how do I get return from a limited marketing spend? The best thing to do is to focus at the bottom of the funnel. So certain marketing channels sit at low funnel, certain marketing channels sit up the funnel. So the ones that sit at the bottom of the funnel is SEO, paid ads on Google, and email marketing, marketing automation. So if you've got limited funds, limited spend, focus on those three to yes. begin with, and then go upwards to mid funnel strategies. That's where your content, your social exists, and then your brand awareness strategies, which bigger companies will split their marketing spend into those three different categories. Brand awareness typically is around 33% of spend, but it's things like above the line media. Most SMEs don't have the budget for that. So SMEs focus that that spend at the bottom of the funnel and that will get you the best results. You're giving us even more there. I mean, so, such good, rich content. There's too much for me to say what's my favorite thing. <laughs> I've, I've got pagefuls of notes here, but what I will say is, I just love the way that we've got to 100 leads and we've empowered people. And I, I think everybody, including me, is thinking differently about about leads coming in. So Great. We're... We've got to get marketing working, haven't we? You know, uh, so many people don't know where their lead generation or marketing yeah. effectiveness is. Let's get marketing working. Go back and listen to the first one of this, and that's the attribution model that we talked about. That's right, yeah. What's been your favorite part today, Steve? Do you know what? I loved the fact you've just asked me to do this off the cuff. I think it's great. But look, I, I also really am passionate about conversions. If you're just driving traffic to your website and it's not converting, or if you don't know if it's converting, there are so many wonderful pieces of technology that can now be used yeah. to drive and harness the power of AI, the power of lead tracking and cookie technology. You can utilize all of these things for a fairly inexpensive monthly cost to drive conversions. 
And so if you're not doing that, things like chat, we work with a partner called Mellow Chat. Go check them out. They're amazing. Yeah. Real people, no bots allowed, real individuals that will capture leads from your site. Anything we can do to increase conversion is adding tangible returns to the bottom line. It's going to increase our profitability. Remember the five ways, right? Go to back to good old Brad Sugar's yeah. classic action coach theory. The first one, of course, is lead generation, but then the second is conversions. Marketing can increase conversions as well as driving leads to the top of the funnel. Steve Pelfort, thank you very much, man. My pleasure, James. Great to be here and big respects to the BizX podcast, Game Places. Hey there, James here with an exciting announcement that BizX Awards is coming to the ACC Liverpool from the 18th to the 19th of April with an incredible lineup of speakers. You're going to meet the likes of Stephen Mulhern, Donald Miller, Deborah Meaden, and many, many more. Book your spot right now at thebizx.co.uk. And if you've enjoyed listening to the Business Excellence podcast, make sure to comment your top learnings and favorite moments, as well as like and subscribe. See you next time.